day back again at 3 o'clock. Here are the, the win totals in the SEC. Garrett's had this for about three weeks. FanDuel, Georgia and Texas at the top, both above 10. And we're going to do over-under here and take you to the end of the show with this. And I will read any – attach my name, and I'll read your comments about who you think might be a little bit too high or maybe too low. And Georgia, Texas. I thought Georgia would be a half a win ahead of UT, but that's where they are right now. What's uh, are over under? Is that what you're asking? Just the thoughts about yeah, ten and a half oh. for both both those teams, and that means that obviously they're going to play, and uh, and who knows? Uh, both might be in the playoff. You would think, especially with it going twelve, they might have four teams or more. But Georgia, Texas, both at ten and a half. I still expect that even with Texas with so much momentum and so much back, I still thought Georgia might be slightly at the top. But that's cutting hairs right there. Uh, yeah, I think Georgia's uh, one of the odds-on favorites to win the title next year, and uh, Texas waltzing their way to the SEC. It could have been a lot uglier. I mean, you could have been coming off of a much different type of a year, but uh, you find yourself operating at peak condition right now, and uh, the schedule's favorable. Uh, you do play Georgia, um, and the schedule, I think, is going to be a lot of fun for for Texas fans, just that first year and the new experiences and the new road trips and all of that. But uh, they're set up well with Quinn Ewers uh, at the top of the list of, as far as those coming back. You've got some uh, really good offensive linemen blocking for him. Obviously, uh, skill-wise, they're going to lose some players that are very talented, but they've been recruiting well, and I don't really worry too much about anything offensively now that they've gotten their offensive line squared away. That was an issue for a while, but no longer, so uh, I don't fret too much about them being able to fill skill position spots, no matter how good uh, Mitchell or Worthy uh, could be. And they've gone out and got Matthew Golden and, and so on. So, And then we saw you know, last year Jonathan Brooks get hurt, and didn't really skip a beat. I mean, Jaden Blue is a, is a star in the making, and they've got other backs as well. So there's there's everything in in you know in their pockets right now as far as having all the tools at their disposal. I think there's a couple of questions maybe here and there, but for the most part, Texas is uh, walking in as best as you could possibly have imagined. Even the schedule, I mean, that that worked out in their favor ultimately. So yeah, I think ten and a half is. Not something I would necessarily go with because I just feel like walking in, there's going to be a couple more lumps. It's not just going to be that easy for them, but I can understand why you put them at 10 and a half because of all the things that I just mentioned. And then Georgia, obviously, they're the, the ultimate favorite in the SEC at this point heading into next year with all that they have returning. So um, it's kind of weird to see that, uh, but it's not surprising, honestly. Well, you, you also, uh, I think you'll see a, a big jump from C.J. Baxter uh, in the rushing department with Jaden Blue, I think they'll be just fine and, and they'll maybe, reload. Yeah. Was I thinking of Baxter Blue, who played more in the, the tail Jayden, end? Jaden Blue, probably more yeah. often in the end. Baxter think he had was, the fumble against uh, Washington, yeah, yeah, but yeah. still an explosive. They're freshman. both great. Yeah, yeah they're yeah. both going to be really, really good. So, yeah, they don't have a lot of holes to fill. I mean, here and there, like I said, but uh, they can easily patch that up through NIL and, and the transfer portal, or I didn't mean through the transfer portal and through uh, their, their high school recruiting. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's weird to see once again, just because year one, we're all expecting them to take some lumps and maybe they will. I mean, this is all it is, is just a projection, uh, but they could not have planned this any better uh, no. the first year in the SEC. Saban retires. Uh, yeah. you, you wonder where LSU is. Uh, Garrett wonders where LSU oh, is. I definitely wonder where LSU Oklahoma's is. Oklahoma's not really at, that's something at their that, peak. Yeah, I wanted to get it. Remember when we had the college football playoff odds mm. and we saw OU way down, which is not a surprise because I don't think there's a lot of hype with them at all. I mean, no hype. And then you saw Alabama even like right down to that point of right at the 12 to 14 range. And here, though, at nine and a half along with a few others. I'll get to that. But Oklahoma, seven and a half, never was projected since they won the national title under Stoops in 2000. Would they've ever been projected at anything under eight or nine wins or more in the Big 12? I mean, there is hype, though. It is for Jackson Arnold that he's going to be the, the next coming of all the great quarterbacks that they've had. And there's been a long time coming, even though it hasn't really been that long. But uh, it just feels like it's been a while of sort of the buildup of Jackson Arnold and him taking the reins. And so he has them now. And, yes, yeah, seven and a half. I, 
I would imagine there's a lot of very confident Oklahoma fans that would go over there, and they did not have a bad year. I mean, they went and won uh, a bunch of games last year. Obviously, not a very good finish uh, with uh, the Arizona loss in the bowl game. But you know, how do you judge bowl games even nowadays? But it was a it was a much better year for uh, Brent Venables than I think some expected. Although still not getting to the championship game in the Big Twelve these last couple of years, which has got to be a, a little bit of a frustration because no matter how many times that you won it. Uh, you didn't even get into the game these last couple of tries. And so uh, that's a, a departure from the norm. And, and now it only gets tougher to get back into a game like that. So, um, yeah, we'll see if Jackson Arnold is all that he's cracked up to be. And even if he is, that might not still be enough to navigate the SEC in year one and go win nine, ten games like you're accustomed to. So this is a, a very interesting kind of a story because I, I do wonder how fans and maybe with the expanded playoff this will answer those questions but like the days of living and dying by one and two lost seasons are just yep. not going to be realistic anymore yeah, for a lot of teams there's so. going to be fans that have to get used to three and not that they will like it but get used to having nine and three or ten and uh eight and four uh one thing about you're talking about go back to texas and running backs Against uh, Iowa State, Baxter had 100 yards. The next week against Texas Tech, Blue had 100 yards, both of them. Baxter had more numbers in the end by a couple of 300 yards, but both of them very much talented and ready to reload and not reload, but to, to get their more, more of their opportunities for a full year next year. I think they're reloading because I don't think that they have to rebuild post Jonathan Brooks. I mean, they did that in the middle of the season and they didn't need to build much at all. They just kind of picked up the torch. He was very good and would love to have seen what he was able to do with the full season under his belt, but they didn't fall off uh, much in my estimation with Blue and Baxter and company taking over for for Brooks. But uh, yeah, 10 and a half in year one's crazy. Seven and a half for Oklahoma. I already saw the spread for OU Texas, like the very early spreads. I think it was double digits or something like that. So um I don't know. I need to go peruse the OU message boards a little bit more and kind of see. Uh, I haven't talked to my family in a while on that side. See what they're kind of feeling as far as this first. I know everybody's excited about it, but again, it's just if you if you're going seven and five, like how how excited are you still? And so that's a that's a big question. We'll get to to find out there in that year number one. By the way, do not let us end the show, Garrett, without reading the the text I received from Space Coast Night. On Tyler Owens, okay. I, 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 we we need, and of course he's right there. I think he even does some work for Noah and also for NASA. Back to the SEC, you have the ten and a half Georgia Texas, and then you have a clump of four teams at nine and a half games, and then of course a couple even A and M and Tennessee at eight and a half. Let's get to those nine and a half teams, and Garrett, you can come in here and be a part of this too. Okay. Craig, Alabama, LSU, who Garrett's not real sold on Missouri coming up with a bullet and Ole Miss of course locked in as well of those four who shouldn't be there I mean I I, I don't know that anybody shouldn't be there because these are just preseason win odds so it's not like it's an exact science of this is absolutely what they're going to finish at it's it's a projection to get people to bet money so I think with all four of those teams you can see a case to why they could win 10 games and you can also see why they'd be under so I think that those are just perfect numbers to try and play that balancing act of on uh, on the over under side of things and so Alabama I think that'd be safe to go under right now just based on everything that we know and here's the other thing how many teams won 10 or more games in the SEC last year like y'all know two 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 yeah. so you got uh, two here with 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 10 wins but then a bunch of them at nine there was a uh, one team that finished with uh or excuse me there was Sorry, five teams finished with 10 wins because I was thinking of uh, by division. So five teams finished with 10 wins. So this lines up where 10 and a half, 10 and a half, that looks like a lot of wins for a lot of teams, but you had 13 win Georgia, 11 win Mizzou, 12 win Bama, 11 win Ole Miss, 10 win LSU, 9 win Tennessee. So um, yeah, the odds favor that one or two of those is probably not going to get to that threshold, but I don't think any of them don't belong um, necessarily. I think you can make the case uh, for why, I mean, Ole Miss has gone all in. We know that. Mizzou's got a ton coming back after a great year. LSU's a question mark. I'll let Garrett kind of get to that. I don't know that I'd go over with them. Um, but Alabama, that one is going to be fascinating, man. Um, they are so used to winning 10 games and and more than 10 games that uh, – the possibility of them only winning like nine games just seems like crazy talk, and that's that's, that's absolutely possible next year. 
Uh, what do you think about LSU, Garrett? Uh, kind of looking at this, I mean, they, there's obviously a lot of work to do on the secondary. You've got to sure that up to get better on the defense. Uh, I was listening to Brian Kelly's interview with J.D. Pakel earlier this week, and Brian Kelly was talking about how their offense is going to have to shift with Garrett Nussmeyer coming in and taking over for Jaden Daniels as you're going to have to rely more heavily on your backs to actually get production, which they've struggled the past couple of years. And then you're also he's expected to see the tight ends be more involved, which if you can get Mason Taylor going the way he was the year before, that can help out. Uh, but kind of looking at this schedule, man, I'm, I'm comfortable giving them eight wins. Um, after that, I, I think it's they, they pretty much got it right. I would probably go under. I would take nine and just play it safe if that was me. I'm not really into betting, but that's where I'm comfortable putting LSU right now just going off of this. All right, here's a question in the chat room. Oklahoma, seven and a half. How many teams in the Big 12's win total that we saw from like a couple of weeks ago? Mm-hmm. Have seven and a half or more wins projected, and there are nine. Nine teams in the Big 12 projected with seven and a half wins or more, and there you have Oklahoma not only at seven and a half, which is lower than they've ever been since 2000 uh, when they won it all, and that wasn't a team expected to win it all, and on top of that, they're in the second column. They're in the second column. So – so yeah, something has to give right there, or they're just going to beat the hell out of each other, right? Oh, yeah. They're just going to beat each other up, and everybody ends up with a couple of losses or a loss or two or more in the SEC. All right? Now, let's go to Tennessee and A&M. It surprises me to see A&M there. I think Mike Elko's doing a heck of a job kind of remolding that team, and, and yet I think eight and a half might be a little bit much. But there's Tennessee at eight and a half. Two years ago, we had one of the fun stories in college football. Last year, good, but took it down a notch. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't have exact picks on these, but just, I mean, first glance, I mean, Tennessee won uh, nine games a year ago. I know the teams aren't the exact same, but I'd expect them to be better than they were last year. Me too. Uh, so I think that eight and a half's dead on. Uh, eight and a half for A&M, I know it sounds like probably way too high, but um, a team that we made fun of, or not we, but in general, the college football public uh, just kind of – you know, did not care about, and when they talked about him, it was mostly to make fun of the Jimbo situation. They still won seven games last year, so to think that with Mike Elko, they can win a couple more, I don't think is absolutely crazy. Now, the schedule may say otherwise, so yeah, with A&M, I wouldn't be sold on that. Tennessee, though, I think that that's more than fair. A&M, though, the, the eight and a half makes it an interesting debate, but I'd probably go under right now. All right, we had somebody in the chat room, Missouri, nine and a half, hmm. Hey, drink which they got a they got some good they stuff. They won eleven going. games last year. Don't they but have the they have the the Durden? Uh, don't they is the quarterback? Yeah, Brady, Cook, Brady Cook's coming back. Yeah, that's what I thought. But you have to replace your defensive coordinator. You lost yes. a lot of talent, so there's going to be some fluctuation. Yeah, Burton, yeah, for yeah sure. The, the, this talented wide receiver uh, that they have at Missouri conundrum. What big With year? Burden. That's what I said. Okay. I, I corrected myself. Big year for Venables. Time to be a damn head coach. Yeah, I think he's done a good job. I just think that um, just the timing of everything and and just the the, uh, the aspects of NIL and stuff that's allowed maybe some of your peers to get a little bit more of a leg up on you, I think has all kind of created a sort of a perfect storm where Oklahoma's not in danger of not being Oklahoma per se anymore. But I do think that your days of just running free in the Big 12, basically, I mean, those days are dead. Um, and just the, the NIL part of this, and I mean, you're, you're just going, man, you're just going from being the, the biggest shark and, and having another one that's about as big and maybe on occasion it, it has a little more to eat and it's an inch bigger than you, but pretty much is you and one other great white. And that was it. That's all you ever had to contend with. And every once in a while... You know, some hammerheads or some makos would come in and cause a little bit of noise from Kansas State or Baylor or whatever, but they were never threatening your place in the bigger conversation, really. And now you're of, in a, yeah. a deep end where there is like eight great whites that all have as much money and prestige and history. Now, you may have more national titles and you may have more Heisman, but they still have some. They don't have, you know, seven and, you know, national, but they've got like five. So there's not, like, you're really splitting hairs, and there's some that are just straight up bigger than you as well. So I, I just, it's just a whole new part of the pool for them to be in. And with Texas, they're coming on just such a hot streak, and you know the money's never ending. They have no worries about any resources whatsoever. They're, I just feel like they're better set up in this environment 
especially right away with Oklahoma, I just still have my reservations. And it's mostly about the fact that just your expectations can't possibly be the same as they have been all these last several years yeah, there's, because there's, there's anxiety. It's just different. Yeah. It's just totally different. Texas, with how everything merged together at once, right about the time when you wondered about whether they would just languish for a while at you know seven and fives or whatever, seven and six, eight and five, you had the transfer portal. You had NIL. Now, part of what they did last year with a lot of those players had nothing to do with that. Homegrown recruits. But all of that coming together at the perfect time for them. And then the opening with A&M slipping, Oklahoma slipping, and then the opportunity to join the SEC. Because when that story broke, everybody probably thought Oklahoma was more set up for that than Texas was at the time. And that has completely flipped the switch. So we'll see with Venables. I mean, if they go 8-4 and four in year one, I'll, I'll be very interested to know what the kind of reaction to that is. Maybe it'll depend on who those eight wins or those four losses are against. You know, did you go 8-4 and four, but you lost to Texas and you lost to A&M and, you know, something like that. Would that – I think it'll depend on the details there. Um, but, yeah, Venables is – you know, he's got to win. I mean, that's, that's the – they're not going to change expectations overall. I mean, they're still going to expect to be a top five – program nationally year in and year out you know how realistic though that is moving forward i do think there's plenty of questions about that how, uh, re how regular that can be yep uh let's see here i think uh, oklahoma wins 10 xavier wolf uh some of you have mentioned that craig looks like he's a little downtrodden because of the oklahoma one thing i will say about him and then he can rant. he's not an idiot he understands what's going on. He's probably as real about Oklahoma football as any Oklahoma football fan and understands what they face as they enter the SEC. Yeah, no, no, I think that's just uh, maybe getting to the end of the week. I'm <laughs> just, uh, I don't know, uh, winding down, but I'm not downtrodden by any, any, means, yeah. any way, shape, or form. No matter how – I mean, look, if they go win five games next year, am I going to be bummed about it? Yeah, it's not ruining my life, though. I, I'm not that uh, – You'll never hear me chant SEC, and it's not going to make my life, you know, better, or worse, uh, too, too incredibly, uh, one way or the other. So, yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm just preparing myself because I just think this is um, a great opportunity. I think solidifying yourself in a league like that, all that makes sense. The money, all that makes sense. I just, I just kind of know, and I guess if there's any part of me that's downtrodden it's just that i know the days of expecting them to be in the conference title game pretty much every year are long dead and gone now that's for sure okay so think about the 12 team playoff i know we're already going to like 24 soon but think about the 12 team playoff next year conference champion is in and among the top seeds right so that's either georgia or texas then on top of that if you have the four conference champions in the group of five highest-ranked champions, there's, what, seven at-large teams? Look at that clump of nine and five. That's what Sankey like, likes to look at, but there are other conferences that might have a, a clump as well of the nine and a half to ten wins, too. This is what's going to be fun about how they break up this at-large. But that will be interesting of Alabama, who maybe they will surprise. Maybe I saw... Who was it? Uh, Dallas Turner today at the NFL Combine. A comment, he goes, there are some dogs, there are some dudes that didn't even get to play much this year that did not leave. So much attention on those who did because of the transition. And he said, there are some dudes now that you don't even know who they are unless you're an Alabama fan that are sitting there waiting for their opportunity to prove who they can. And they listen to this chatter, too, about how they might drop a little bit. All right, so then you get down to Kentucky. Stoops has done a really nice job with them. Made them relevant, made them competitive. But, man, when you add Texas and Oklahoma to the mix, they're dropping down to six and a half. Who is that Arkansas? Man, they, they just stuck. They're stuck. Pittman has to get something going. Florida, stuck. South Carolina, Beamer, stuck, although they – I mean, Arkansas and Florida are going to fire their head coaches if they don't yeah, probably yeah, get that, above five that, and a half wins. If, so. that is, if that's the case and they don't even make a bowl game, you're right. And then there's Mississippi State. They've been through the transition since the death of Mike Leach. And then Vanderbilt at the bottom at two and a half. I mean, Auburn at seven and a half, uh, Hugh Freeze taking over more of the offense. Uh, that's, that's an interesting year, too. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of great storylines here. But, uh, yeah, they're uh, – their team, I think we just kind of jumped over, but uh, 
Florida, Arkansas, I mean, those are your hot seat candidates as much as anybody in the country right now. You throw probably Aranda and Baylor in there and maybe a few others, but uh, Napier and uh, Pittman certainly near the top of the list. You know, Shane Beamer. Um, it's getting close. Yeah, man. Like, they, they need to win some games, but, again, it's it's only getting tougher. Although, you know, is it going to be tougher or is it going to be more watered down? It's kind of hard to, to tell because you're technically adding two more great teams, but – you know, does the schedule now? You have more teams, so you do you get more of a break, or is it going to be tougher? I don't. I don't know how exactly that. I don't have the schedules in front of me, but I'm looking for South Carolina. We've, we've so. seen some of those schedules. Let me do this with while you're doing that. I Shane, just mean like in general, yeah. like is adding more teams going to water it down a little bit to where you're maybe catching an extra break that you wouldn't otherwise, or is it just make? Or are you getting another game or two that are even tougher than well, what you already it, had? It, that's what that's, I'm saying. I don't that's know. That's why I hate. The, that's the wrong word. That's why I will miss what the Big 12 had, which is gone, long gone, where everybody played everybody, so you did not get a break based on an, an algorithm. You did not get a, a schedule that might have, uh, with all due respect to what I'm about to mention, yeah, you might play, let's say, Georgia, and you might play LSU, but then you also get Kentucky, South Carolina, Florida. And that depends on what year you're getting them. Well, it's no, not, I mean, and it's going to rotate. Yeah. I get it. Well, but – for South Carolina in particular this year, yeah, it's definitely going to hinder them because you got after you you have a bye week in the middle of the season and then October hits and you go you have you host Ole Miss and then you have back to back games at Bama at Oklahoma. So yeah, yeah. it's it's worse for them. Uh, Shane Beamer, by the way, speaking of South Carolina, James Crowley, their wide receivers coach, is now with Kirby Smart at Georgia. He replaced him with Brian McClendon. Here's a quote from Beamer. I didn't think we'd be here again introducing a wide receivers coach, but it is what it is. The previous receivers coach made a decision that he felt was best for his family. We collected the 450000 and then some, and we were owed for violating or leaving his contract. Uh, that we were owed for violating or leaving his contract. It allowed us to go out and hire an even better wide receivers coach in my mind. That's not a knock on anybody. Yes, it is. That's what I feel about the guy we have right here. So there was a little shot from Shane Beamer across the bow. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, Quinton, dude, just play an 11-game conference schedule. I, I, I wish there were more conference games. Hell, the SEC hasn't even gotten a nine yet. They will. That's going to happen. And I think especially when they move that college football playoff in a couple of years to 14 or more. Yeah, I think that it, Yeah, that was uh, some, some nice shade. Um to follow it right up with, oh, uh, that's, you know, not shit. Yeah, that's absolutely. That's not a knock was, on anybody. Yes, That it was is. absolutely a knock. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I think the SEC will will add another game here sooner rather than later. That seems to be the uh, the the foregone conclusion. So, and why wouldn't you? I mean, I know it's, it's the whole it's tougher thing, but if you've got all these teams, you didn't get them to not play them. Like, if you want to talk about all these great home and away games and all these great opportunities, well – yeah, then get rid of the, the November game versus, you know, Jacksonville Eastern University and yep. play Oklahoma instead. And, yeah, you might lose an extra game, but in the expanded playoff, it's not going to hurt you as much. So bigger brands, bigger games, uh, yeah, I want to see uh, another conference game and, and another potential big matchup. So um, how the, again, I circle back to this every time with the expanded playoff, but the days of having to go 10-2 and two or you're completely or, or 11 and one or you're screwed and don't have much of a shot those days are over i mean you're going to be able to lose for some people and especially sec teams you're going to be able to lose a couple games and still get in the playoff now can you lose three i think there's going to be years where that's a hot debate but uh yeah i'm i'm all for seeing if we're going to talk super leagues and all that let's let's get the super matchups together which means you know, having an extra conference game. So, yeah, absolutely. I, I And this is something that we've said before and others who have been a part of this show, especially a couple of guys that cover Texas that have joined us or UT fans. You look at who they get to play next year. Regardless of where it is or what, they're playing Michigan. They're always going to still play that non-conference type game. They're playing Oklahoma, Georgia, Texas A&M, so that's redone. Plus, they have Florida and their Arkansas as a former rival. So they get all of their former and current rivals. And, and that doesn't include other games that they have of teams that might jump up a little bit. Because somebody in that second column, not sure who it's going to be. Maybe it's Hugh Freeze in Auburn. Maybe it is Venables in Oklahoma. 
Someone in that right column will be in the left column by the end of the year, and somebody in the left column will fall into the right column, and it may not just be a and if, if, if they're the ones that might be the ones that fall. Yeah, and we'll see how Jeff Levy does at Mississippi State. I mean, uh, that'll be a, a, a definite interesting situation to watch with him taking over and just kind of where do they fall in the grand scheme of things because, you know, they're not – gaining two spots with Oklahoma Texas coming in they're dropping two more spots uh so yeah they have a lot of work to do there after what was a very disappointing uh season a year ago um and then Vanderbilt's I mean that's just the spot they're always going to occupy uh forever and ever and ever unless the SEC expands and, and waters itself down in some form or fashion but they're not there really to win football games anyways they're there for other reasons historically academically etc so that's just kind of where you are and if you can get above two and a half then that's great and if not then nobody expected really otherwise except for maybe yourselves but um yeah, Mississippi State is intriguing because of the levy factor and, and how he does with his first go around as a head coach. And, and yeah, somebody in the right will end up in the left and vice versa. But uh, it's very interesting to throw two teams of, of that stature into the mix. And I think it's going to be a lot of fun. And I'm excited to see what it all looks like on the other side and, and on a week to week basis, much like I am with the Big Ten with uh, USC and UCLA and Oregon and Washington. It's yep. the same thing there. And then I know it's not quite the same as far as historically but you all of a sudden throw Colorado and Dion, Arizona Utah, and Arizona State yep. into the mix so I mean every league uh, and then ACC's got you know SMU Stanford and Cal that's four out of four as far as ranking the excitement over the new coming you know the newcomers I would think but uh, that's still gonna throw a couple wild cards into the mix that otherwise haven't been there so yeah for the power four conferences uh, if you want to call them that, the, the whole landscape is is different from just what we who, saw a year ago. Who gained more with the changes in the four power autonomy four conferences? Texas OU, monster names to the SEC, or the four, Oregon, Washington, USC, UCLA, or the Big Ten? I don't know. I think it's almost splitting hairs, really. Uh, I think both did well for themselves. I think that's a question that can't really be answered now. It'll be answered five, ten years from now, and we see who's winning national titles. If it's Oregon and Washington winning national titles or USC, then you say the Big Ten. But if Oklahoma and Texas are just further pushing the SEC to or towards winning more, then you know, obviously it'd be them. So, yeah, I think it, it kind of remains to be seen. Plus, you're comparing four versus two. Uh, so there's, uh, there's that. But I, I'd say – I think the SEC is based on geography. I think yeah. it's all set up. It's all together. It's all together. It's together. You don't have these L.A. to Lansing you know, road trips or East Lansing road trips uh, like you're going to have. Or L.A. to Rutgers. Or L.A. to Rutgers. So, yeah, I would think the SEC just because they still actually have a, a league name that makes sense. And right. they're about the only ones at this point. I guess the ACC doesn't even make sense anymore as much because they've got two teams from the West Coast. So Yeah, I wake up one day, Atlantic Coast Conference with two teams on the Pacific Coast. Yeah, right? so I, I'd say the SEC does. Jared, uh, Jared or Gerard, 